Hello all and welcome to this latest uh, NCSE webinar for science education advocates. We're going to be talking about doing outreach to student groups and, and how to involve students in fights against bad science education. Uh, I think it's a pretty natural fit and I'm really excited to have two people who've done a lot of outreach to, to student groups with me. We've got Dan Temberton from the Secular Students Alliance and Jenny Marino from 350.org. Uh, both of those groups do a lot of a really amazing work. And um, one of the things that I, like to, that, that I like to do with these webinars is to introduce the activists out there in the field to the great resources that exist, not just in NCSE, but in other organizations. And uh, you know, 350 and, and SSA both do really amazing work and can be really great allies uh, that I hope everyone who watches this will, will take advantage of. For those of you who have not used the software before, I want to do a quick uh, orientation and then and then hand it off to to the panel. Uh, so there is a chat feature. It's in the the go to webinar control panel at the bottom of it. So we can you can I think send messages to us there, but we can also if there's a link for something that we're talking about that uh, we want to share with you, um, we'll type it in there and then you can check those links. This will also be recorded and we'll put those links on the, the web page on NCSC's website so you can get back to them also. There is also a, a way that you can type in questions to us uh, and I'll see those and I'll either type a response back or I'll read them off for discussion if I don't know the answer or if I think it's something that everyone should share. And you, there's also a little hand icon in the, in the side of the window which you can hit and, and indicate that you'd like to be unmuted if you have a question or comment that you wanted to share that way. Uh, and, and I hope that you will share your experiences as this goes. And I did also create a little poll that while, while, we're, while people are still logging in, while we're getting started, I'm gonna just start that up because we are curious who, who you all are and what your, what your connection is and what your experiences are uh, so I'm guessing that a lot of you are going to be in the, the teacher, professor, faculty category here. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm crossing my fingers that a few students did sign in, but we'll see. So uh, while, while we're doing that, um, Jenny, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? And then uh, I'll, let you, I'll let you two introduce yourselves, and then we can do the, the short um, case studies presentations. But Jenny, if you want to tell us a little bit about yourself yeah. at 350 uh, and then everyone. Dan. Great. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Jenny Marino. I work with 350.org. I'm the U.S. field manager, which means I get to work with a troop of field organizers located all across the U.S. Um, who organize dire directly with student groups on a divestment campaign. Um, and the campaign is working to get universities to pull their endowments out of the fossil fuel industry. Um, before working with 350, uh, I did student organizing with campuses in Texas um, and then worked as a student organizing around corporate power and the coal industry in uh, Missouri. So that's a little bit about me. 350.org is a global organization working to mobilize communities to build grassroots power to take on climate change as an issue. Um, so our real focus is on building community power um, to take on fossil fuel corporations. Great. And, and Dan, did you want to talk a little bit about your work in SSA? Yes. I am Dan Pemberton and I am the SSA's California and Nevada Regional Campus Organizer and I love my job. I get to work with um, not only student groups all over the West Coast, but also um, I get to connect them with off-campus uh, secular and skeptic groups. I get to work with um, the NCSC, all kinds of different science education uh, groups out there, and I get to also just talk about everything I love, which is almost entirely sciencey things. And a little bit about the SSA, the Secular Student Alliance. Um, uh, its mission is to organize and unite and educate and serve students uh, and student communities that promote ideals of science and critical inquiry. And um, I, 
and one of the things that uh, I have personally been really active with over the last uh, few semesters, few quarters, um, has been getting uh, more and more science educators on tour on the West Coast. It seems so many of them are in the Midwest and the East Coast, and we have um, really a kind of a fresh new younger lineup of um, people who are not only wonderful scientists and um, science researchers, but um, also have a really big passion for um, communicating um, uh, new scientific research and do it quite effectively. Um, and one of the um, one of the other things that um, I've been finding in student groups that has become more and more relevant to um, share uh, uh, information and data and just overall um, take an educational stance on not just what's happening right now on the um, field of battling um, creation, creationism, intelligent design in schools, or even um, climate change policy, but also um, the one of the remnants of a lot of that in younger people, even in the secular community, is also um, the uh, belief, so to speak, in a lot of pseudoscientific um, matters, whether it's astrology, homeopathy, um, magnetic bracelets, what have you, just fill in the blank. Um, but that's uh, kind of where my passion for science education comes into a whole new generation because um, there are a whole, there's a whole new world of whether it's social networking or other new means of communication that I think are really important to also have a conversation about and what is a good approach, good etiquette for reaching out to student groups and being able to um, collaborate on new projects, new um, activities and endeavors on your local campuses. Great. So, all right, I'm going to close the poll now and I'll, I'll show you the, the results. So uh, no, no students, at least yet, uh, signed in, but we do have uh, a lot of people who are on campus as, as teachers or professors or faculty or who live in college towns and um, a few people who don't, don't at least think of themselves as having a connection to campuses. But I suspect if we, if we talk about it a little bit more that we'll find that they do. Uh, or do have ways to, to reach out to students. So uh, I'll just say a little bit uh, to set things up and then I'll, I'll let you guys talk about your case studies because uh, I do want to keep this sort of uh, as practical as we can be and, and give people good useful guidance on how they can really do this. Um, but just to help help explain why I think this is so important, you know, students are students. Are students. If we're talking about science education, th that is the constituency. If you're when when I've been at hearings in about textbooks in Texas, or when there's a, a local school board meeting, or when there's when Zach Coughlin, a high school student, goes and testifies before the Louisiana legislature to try to repeal the a creationist bill there, legislators listen in ways that they don't listen when scientists show up in lab coats. Unfortunately, uh, I I would like to live in a world where scientists show up in in policymaking bodies and everyone sits down and listens very carefully. But if a student takes time out of, you know, to get engaged in politics, policymakers listen in ways that they don't otherwise. And students often have skills that people who are not in school, who are not that young, don't have. They have experiences that they don't have. They can connect to, to different groups. On, on a college campus, on, at a state school, you've got people from all over the state who are coming together in one place. If you're trying to organize a statewide campaign, there's probably no better way to reach out statewide than to walk around a college campus and say, where are you from? Can you talk to five people back in your hometown? Uh, if there's just incredible opportunities there, but it's also, it, it's also harder. I mean, I know this, I've, I've tried to do that outreach. Uh, Dan and Jenny can confirm that it's not always easy, uh, but it's incredibly rewarding. And so I hope at the end of this, that those of you who are participating or those watching uh, online later, will give it a shot. Cause I think there are great opportunities and we're gonna talk about some of the challenges and what we can do to, to get around some of those challenges. You know, students have different schedules, they have different experiences of workplaces and how they want to be supervised and how they want to be approached and managed and to what extent they want to be managed uh, as volunteers and what, what, they, what are they going to get out of it? What, what's that pitch on that end and how do you approach that uh, in a way that's respectful of them and their experience and, and their value? So, uh, and that's, a, I think, a pretty good way to queue up. I think we're going to have Jenny go first. Right. Yes. So um, what, can you tell us a little bit about uh, one particular campaign and some of the lessons that you've learned from that of what 
to do and what not to do? No, no, no. Sure. Um, so I want to use a fairly large case study of the way that 350.org reached out to students in launching our fossil-free divestment campaign. So this campaign launched in uh, the fall of 2012, and it became clear to us that um, to run a divestment campaign on the scale that we wanted to, um, we would need to reach out to a lot of different students um, all across the country. And so a few of the things that we kept in mind is how do we make contact with students, um, make this something that feels exciting, um, but also recognizing our staff capacity and um, really the way that these campaigns need to be run. How do we let go of the reins almost immediately um, and really let students take the lead? Um, and the way that we chose to do that is we launched a tour. The tour is called the Do the Math Tour and we worked through um, the math of climate change, and then ended the tour with a little bit of a pitch to students um, that this is a very big problem, climate change is very scary, um, but there is something very concrete that you can do, and it's run this divestment campaign. Um, so since that tour, uh, we've had a staff of field organizers who have been able to support students running divestment campaigns, um, but really defer to the leadership of students uh, and support them in what they want to accomplish. Um, and since that tour, we've had uh, nearly 400 college campuses uh, sign up to run divestment campaigns, and a couple hundred are very active um, with large groups on campus running these campaigns. Um, so to sort of dive into why I think that was an effective way to reach out to students, um, it was flashy, it was exciting, um, and it gave a clear uh, action item that students could take without expecting students to sort of like imagine all of the different ways that they could take action on climate change. Um, so I guess the, the piece of advice I would pull out of it is um, really know what you have to offer to students. Um, think about, you know, what is the student's self-interest? You know, what are they going to get out of working with you on this? Is it something that they're individually interested in? Is it taking a big issue and giving a clear action item? Um, so really knowing you know, what you're providing and what you're expecting students to provide. Um, and then I think imagining things that we could have done differently. Um, we had a lot more interest than we expected. <laughs> students um, very much dove into this opportunity. We thought that we might have a couple dozen campaigns that came out of it tops, um, but we're really expecting like a handful. And we came out with hundreds of campus campaigns that we couldn't really support. So I think um, recognizing, you know, what you have to offer um, and the scale of the support you can lend um, and sort of putting that out there up front probably could have been a, a good option. Um, but since then, we've really worked side by side with students um, and really relied on students' own wisdom, knowledge of their campuses, knowledge of what they want to get out of it, um, and really listened for what we can provide to students, um, and then sought to provide those services. So things like um, setting up connections with speakers, um, putting together webinars on topics that students may be interested in, one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching and mentorship, um, and increasingly really getting out of the way so that students can take, take the lead. Um, and that's, that's sort of been the process that we've used. And I'd be happy to talk more about um, the community organizing aspects of it and really how to motivate students to um, take on issues in their own individual way um, from here. Great. Um, and, and again, for, for folks following along, you can type in questions as we go and I'll either, they're in the, the GoToWebinar control panel, if you have questions or comments, um, I can either read them out and we can talk about them, or if I know the answer, I might just write back to you and say, oh, actually it's over here. But in general, but so feel free to, to pitch in that way. If you have experiences with, with student outreach or questions that you want to share, uh, you can also raise your hand and do it that way. Uh, but right now I'm going to turn it over to, to Dan and if you can talk about uh, you know, case study and some of the, the lessons that you've learned and how that matches up with what, uh, what Jenny was telling us. 
Okay, wonderful. Uh, the case study that um, I decided is probably a little more relevant to this is something that's happening right now. And there was a very interesting, uh, I think, phenomenon that, that a lot of um, campus groups experienced over the, um, this past February. And that was when many of them decided not that, um, well, let me back up. This past February was when the uh, Bill Nye Ken Ham debate um, uh, about whether um, creationism was a good model for um, or, uh, basically origins of science uh, to be taught in schools. Um, very, uh, it was a very publicized debate. But what was very interesting for uh, many campus groups and off-campus groups as well who wanted to live stream the debate was that they had, uh, for maybe the first time in um, in anyone's history, their own event publicized on 24-hour news channels. And that opened up an entire world for many people and a whole new, um, uh, uh, I think, arena of activities and uh, discussions on their campuses for um, what exactly um, science has to offer um, individuals as opposed to it just being um, the, uh, the opponent to religious beliefs or religion being the opponent to uh, scientific policy in America. And there have, um, uh, and that's basically been what's keeping uh, me very busy for the past uh, several months is um, helping campuses or campus groups rather organize um, different scientific uh, activities and events on their campus. And we are now basically we're getting closer to next year's Darwin Day than we are further away from the last, which is um, this is probably by far the most exciting year we've had in a very long time, um, almost entirely due just to the one event. Um, uh, but what this is also doing for us right now is that this is also allowing um, for uh, the what we call the 30 under 30, um, the uh, about a th or the, the third under 30, excuse me, um, the third of students who um, identify as non-religious in one way or another, um, uh, whether it's a third who are explicitly just the uh, hard agnostics, atheists, the nuns, or the spiritual but not religious, um, to now um, with on an internal level, um, figure out where it is that they are kind of at collectively with um, their understanding of what is happening in the scientific um, world right now. Um, most of what most of the science that is still being talked about in campus groups is um, 30 years old, and anything that's um, less than 30 years old as seen as um, mysterious, ethereal, black box, and um, big part of what I'm trying to do is bring the conversation of science to be more um, a little broader, a little more, um, uh, I think, um, method based as opposed to it being just a series of facts, which sadly it um, too commonly boils down to. Uh, and the um, and what I am uh, strongly encouraging um, all any um, educators off campus groups um, really anybody who is not already a part of an on an on campus group um, is to at the very least open up um, dialogue with your local uh, secular campus group even if it's not the um, the nearest uh, college or university or high school to where you live um, if you know of one uh, there are many many students who have a lot of um, these sorts of activities um, kind of churning around in their heads and are really just um, in need of support from other people to maybe uh, fill in a few gaps. There are some wonderful, wonderful uh, on-campus um, group organizers that are really good at getting people together but may not be so good at large event planning or um, <laughs> running a, an event calendar that goes out more than just two weeks from now. And that's where a lot of the off-campus um, humanists and other other uh, science groups are really, really important. Um, and it's uh, and that's where I'm kind of hoping a lot of our conversation and questions are going to go to in a little bit, um, because that is a very um, uh, I think of, I think a very um, dynamic and really changing month to month on what the best ways to network with on-campus groups are, but um, there is uh, really a whole new horizon that, it, that has come up just in the last few months because of a single very, very heavily publicized debate that really got on everyone's radar. And, and so that raises a question that, that I think about a lot when I'm trying to think about um, even for the, the, the local skeptic group that I'm, I'm on the board of, we're, we're right near University of California, Berkeley. I know that there are student secular and skeptic groups there, but 
the presidency of the group changes every year. The, the officers are constantly turning over. Uh, and so it's just hard to, to maintain a long-term relationship, especially if we don't, if there's not something that we need right now. If there's something that we need right now, we can find the group and say, hey, can you help us out with this? But if it's just in terms of sort of maintaining a relationship, which is really valuable and really important to do, but when, when the leadership changes so rapidly, how do you, what, what's the best way to, to maintain that connection to the group when the group is changing, you know, every four years it completely reinvents itself, right? Well, that is a good question, and there's a bit of a complicated answer. The uh, um, from the off campuses perspective, I strongly, strongly recommend getting on the local campus groups uh, Facebook group, not just their like page. I am I'm a very, very big advocate for campus groups to have um, have discussion groups as well, and I encourage off campus group um, people to join them because you get to see what the group is talking, the on campus group is talking about. You get to see the announcements when there is a new election, new set of leaders. Um, but it's even worse than leaders changing every four years. Um, I have been. Uh, heavily advocating for on-campus groups to have annual elections and bring in new blood year to year. And just a very quick aside of what that does for both for both on-campus and off-campus groups is that if you're electing freshmen and sophomores into your uh, board for an on-campus group, then your juniors and seniors get to stay active in the group as experienced um, uh, sort of um, um, uh, p past leaders that get to um, impart wisdom and experience onto the uh, onto the new leaders and then that also helps establish a relationship with future alumni. And that also I think is going to pay off five years from now in um, bridging even um, I think farther communication with off-campus groups because those alumni now are also going to start going to off-campus group activities and events. Um, but the other thing is is that I'm also strongly encouraging on-campus groups to have um, relationships with off-campus groups. If you're an educator or an off-campus group um, activist who is a member of a secular group, um, find out if your group is a member of your local United Corps chapter. Um, that is an excellent way to um, get access to your local on-campus groups as well because United Corps does a good job at, um, at strategically networking the two. And for the for those who don't know, uh, that's the COR is the Coalition of Reason. It, it, it's what, yes. let's send out the yes. we can send a, a link around to that so that people can find it. But it's um, they exist as umbrella groups for sort of humanist, secularist, pro science, pro you know puppies and good things groups to get together. Uh, a lot of the billboards that have gone up around the country talking about these sorts of issues uh, have been sponsored in part by that. Uh, and, and so they, yeah, they, they definitely operate very well as that sort of umbrella that can help people move from off campus, from, from their on campus life and into a, a similar sort of community off campus. And I'm sure the same things come up in the environmental world in climate change. I mean, 350 is not just a campus organization. It, it has the campus component as well as others. So how do you, how do you maintain those connections and how do you move people from their, their campus groups into the broader 350 campaign and how do you connect the, the broader 350 campaigns that might be happening off campus, make, make sure that they stay connected to what's happening on campus. Okay, cool. Um, so definitely it's something that is sort of a moving target. Um, we're always trying to figure out ways to engage students after graduation. Um, and some of it is really just finding ways to connect student leaders with community leaders. Um, so definitely I agree with what Dan said about sort of creating um, organizational memory on campus. Um, some ways we've done that is just like what Dan said, um, supporting student groups that have younger officers um, and are, are having sort of like the seniors imparting wisdom and knowledge. Um, with younger students. Uh, but also there have been some groups who have actually had written documents of um, community members that they've worked with in the past, uh, events that they've held in the past so that they're not screening the same film every semester, every year, um, and really making sure that you know younger students are coming in with some knowledge. Um, another way that they've done that is having uh, like a buddy for new members where um, a student will be sort of like the new member uh, orienteer. And as new members join the group, they'll explain what the group does, um, 
with what they've done in the past relationships that they have in the community um, so that new members immediately feel like a part of the group um, and are also connected with everything that the group has done. Um, in terms of connecting with off-campus groups, there have been a few ways that we've tried to do this. Um, and one way that we're planning on, but have not done yet, so I'll give you a little sneak peek. Um, in the past, we've run a program called the Fossil Free Fellowship. Um, and the goal of that program is to connect a class of uh, between 30 and 40 students with community organizations where they live or work. Um, so students from freshman year through uh, some graduating seniors will be placed for a summer uh, with a community organization working on climate or environmental justice issues um, to organize and sort of provide labor to that group for the summer. And then ideally, they'll be coming back to campus with those relationships um, and the ability to tie together their campus group and that community group based on the relationship that they've built as someone working with the group that summer. Um, and then coming up uh, next year, we're planning something sort of like a trade show where different um, climate, environmental justice, climate justice groups can come together and meet students who are graduating in a city. Um, and so the idea would be that they can present a little bit about what their group does, a little bit about um, what opportunities are available for folks who want to join. And students can go together um, to meet all of these different groups and sort of decide how they might want to engage in the future. Um, with the idea being, it's really scary to graduate and not know anyone and join a group that you're not quite sure what they're all about. Um, maybe you don't really relate to people who are in the group. Um, so the idea would be, let's give students some safety in numbers as they're graduating um, to go together with members of their group and decide together how they may want to uh, stay involved in the future. So we haven't tried it yet, so I don't have any reports of how successful they are, um, but I think hopefully it'll give students a way to tap into these um, community chapters. And if there are groups that wanted to be listed as part of that, is there a place that they can go to, to sign up or someone they can get in touch with? So we haven't started them yet, um, but if you do have a group that you'd like to have engaged, um, you can email me. My email address is jenny uh, at 350.org. So J-E-N-N-Y at 350.org. All right, and so I'll, I'll send that out. And Dan also put a link to the um, to SSA's website and some of the documents that they have as help for students. Uh, the other thing that I we, we were talking a little bit about before we signed on was how, how do you talk to, when, when you're, if you're going to a student group, you've got a campaign going on. I mean, I, I tend to think about what we do here at NCSE. You know, there's a, the State Board of Education is considering new standards and there's a block that wants to take climate change and, and evolution out of the standards. They don't want students to have to learn about it. Um, and so let's say that you're a member of one of these, of, of a group that's working on those sorts of issues. You would like to have students come with you to testify before the board and help you spread the word about it. What are things not to say? Um, and what are, the, what are the best ways to find those student leaders um, and to approach them and, and make it clear the nature of the partnership, right? What are, what are things that you can say that could be really offensive um, or off-putting, and what are things that, and and also what are reasonable expectations? You know, what's, how much can you, how much independence should you leave to the students, and how much, um, how much oversight is it important to have in that context, given that they're students and people who have been doing this for longer might have some particular ideas about how it's supposed to be done. Uh, and this, there's a related question that Patrick Van Slee typed in. Um, do you ever have to pop back in to provide guidance? Uh, has there ever been a point where you've looked again to find the students engaging potentially counterproductive methods? Uh, I could certainly see something like that happening around the, the Ken Ham Bill Nye debate, where they decide to just do something that's goofy and that makes the student group looks bad or make the, the cause that they're advocating look, look worse than, than it should, um, rather than making the people that they're trying to mock look bad. And the same thing could surely happen around climate change as well. Yeah, um, I can I can take this. So there were two questions and I can answer the second one first. Um, and then I'll have you remind me what the first one was. Okay. <laughs> so um, have there ever been times when students have, you know, we've looked back at what campus groups are doing and we might not agree. Um, 
You know, I really think that the relationships that we have with these student groups is a pretty independent relationship. So student groups do whatever they want. Um, they're not affiliated with 350.org necessarily. They're not, um, you know, beholden to us in any way. And we really try and operate on trust that students know what's right for their community. Um, they're doing this because it's important for them. Um, and they're really committed to their campus campaign in a way that um, it's very, you know, individual to them. So we don't ever tell students what they can or can't do. We don't have that power, um, nor do I think we would want to. Um, what we do do is um, where there are organizers who are related to these campuses in some way, um, who've organized with them or who are supporting them. Um, those organizers might just ask students to think through, uh, you know, what they hope to get out of this. Is it building their group? Is it um, moving their target? Is it moving the um, administration of the university to rethink um, divestment? Uh, is it somehow engaging new members? Um, so really thinking through what, what do you think you're going to get out of this? How does this um, build your power? Um, and really have students sort of take a step back from the planning um, and really think through what they're accomplishing with it. And if they still think it's a great idea, awesome, good on them, um, and they can take it forward. Um, and then in terms of, you know, if you had an event, I remembered the question, if you have an event um, coming up that you'd like to engage students in, how do you reach out? So this is probably not the most helpful advice, but I think it's the best advice, which is you should build those relationships now. Um, you know, as a student, I remember being asked to come out to every environmental event that was happening in St. Louis. Um, and people would be, you know, asking on campus, they would be making announcements in classes, um, they would send information through listservs. And so I had requests coming at me all the time. Um, sometimes I would go if it was something I already was interested in. Um, but someone just asking me to go to something without a prior relationship is probably not going to motivate me. Um, when I actually engaged as a student in the most productive way, it was because I had relationships with organizers who were putting things together. And I felt, you know, the sort of accountability you have with friends and community members that you have that relationship with. So if you expect that there will be something happening in your region where you would want to motivate students to turn out, build those relationships now, see what you can do for that student group now, um, and really build a mutually valuable relationship. Uh, don't just ask students to turn out all the time because students are, a, you know, they're a special group of people where because they're a student, they have that title for a little while. For some reason, their opinion sort of matters. Um, they are, you know, a brand of what is the future. These people are going to be, you know, taking the lead from here. Um, so their opinions really do matter, but they're also just young adults, um, sometimes not young adults, just people who are, you know, independent thinkers who have their own ideas and who often have a lot of skills that we might not have. Um, so I try to, you know, work with everyone in my organization to see our student uh, allies, not as a resource or a tool or something to turn out. Um, they're not just warm bodies, they're also, um, you know, important members of our community. So I would really encourage you to build those relationships as soon as you can. Um, and if for no other reason, then there are other folks who can join you, not just this other independent group of people. Right. And you were also, b before we signed on, you were also talking about um, the the wisdom of, of approaching it through a sort of, oh, it's a resume builder approach to reaching out to them, which, I mean, you know, I can see how that would be, on some level, that is helpful. You know, I, I'll, you know, offering someone a position of responsibility in an, an off-campus group and saying, hey, you can use it on your resume. but. I, I got the sense that that uh, that doesn't is not the best way to make the pitch initially, at least. It may be true, but it's not the way to make the pitch, right? Yeah, I mean, there are lots of ways that groups motivate students to do things. Um, a few that I've seen that do not seem to work, um, and you can imagine why, is uh, offering sort of like a resume staffer, like you can just say you're an intern and then do all this work. Um, I, I've seen that happen, but it doesn't actually build the sort of like commitment that folks. Um, will use to motivate them into the future. So if you are working to actually organize this person into like a long time uh, committed organizer or activist, um, resume staffers are not the way to do that. Um, the other thing that I've seen people do that I think is actually um, like 
super counterproductive and can turn students off from working with you in the future is uh, guilt and urgency. So um, you, know, you have to come out to this. If you don't come out to this, then we might not win. We need this many people. And if you don't turn out, then you, know, you, should, feel, you should feel bad about that. Um, it sounds crazy, but I think it's often used as a way to turn people out to events. Um, that sort of guilt and urgency will only work for so long um, before students realize, hey, it's actually a lot easier not to feel anything about this at all than to feel constantly guilty um, or under pressure to turn out to something that I actually don't want to come to. Um, so if you're really working to turn people out, build those relationships, get to know people and what motivates them, um, and really find ways that this is actually something that fulfills some need that they have, um, either to be engaged on an issue, uh, to build relationships with people. Lots of people will be your most committed volunteers just because it's a great social outlet for them. Um, so figure out what is that thing that motivates this individual person, and that's the way to turn people out. Um, like catch-all guilt or resume stuffers are not going to do it. That sounds like it might be true for people who are not on campus as well. Turns out students are just humans. <laughs> Dan, did you want to did you want to jump in on on any of those topics of, of... yeah um, a quick note regarding how to approach um, on campus groups you're going to uh, many people probably already know this but you're going to get the full spectrum of uh, leaders um, leaders who are the, the outgoing extroverted energetic kind that of networking with anyone they can. Uh, meet and get up a conversation with but then you're also going to get uh, the kind of leaders um, and just the kind of groups in general that um, uh, want to consider themselves more um, self-sustaining self-sufficient islands um, and in some cases that um, is also a reality because the maybe the campus gives them all the resources and um, really money for events they could ever really need and there isn't um, at least an apparent and clear reason for them to network with off-campus groups um, but the uh, the other thing is, is that if you just get a leader that really isn't that interested, uh, get a relationship, at least even a casual one, going with the rest of the group. And so that when there is the, the next leadership transition coming down the way, you already have an end with that the next uh, generation of leaders. Even if it is a year, year and a half down the line, um, investing now will pay off um, in the near future. Uh, and that's um, and that's really something that that um, I encourage no matter uh, what you're doing or where you are. And if you happen to see a group, if you're near a group that you want to start a relationship with, but it's um, it doesn't seem like they're really even doing a leadership transition, the leaders are graduating, and it doesn't look like it really has a future, I strongly recommend reaching out to. Um, uh, both the Secular Student Alliance and also the Center for Inquiry that also has um, campus uh, affiliates and chapters um, and find out where the um, the next nearest ones are. You can also go on secularstudents.org and look at our map um, because we, all, we not only have campus groups, we also have um, regional staff. Um, I'm a regional campus organizer and then we also have volunteer network coordinators that, um, that are doing what they're doing because uh, um, well, we all love um, getting groups to work together, whether it's on campus, to on campus, or um, connecting uh, campus groups with off-campus um, leaders and people who want to be more involved. Great. Um, Vic Hutchison has raised his hand. He has a question. And uh, Vic, you're unmuted. Hi. Uh, good, good information and good suggestions. Um, a couple of things. I've been observing student groups on both sides of the evolution issue for several years. Uh, there's a major problem that's been addressed, but I would like more information on. Let me give you some examples. The Discovery Institute's IDEA clubs have had the same problem. They had a bunch of them start, and now most of them, I think, are defunct. If you go to their website and look at them, they're no longer there. We had one here that was very, very active with a very assertive, I would say even aggressive leader that made some impressions for about four years. He graduated and the organization died. We've had pro-evolution groups come up that did some great things, especially when we had Discovery Institute speakers and they organized and shot them down. But after a few years, they're gone. What can we do, what suggestions do you have to keep these organizations going. I would suggest that maybe finding one or two dedicated faculty members that have a lot of contact with students 
if you could get them to agree to serve as an advisor to these groups and encourage the groups to get in freshmen each year and sophomores and so on. To me, that is the biggest challenge we have in, in with these student groups. Thank you. Well, I think you just basically uh, just bullet pointed my job description, but that's basically that that is that is exactly what I do. The freshmen are the single most valuable incoming members in an on campus group. The, um, and the other thing is, is that leadership transitions are also my very favorite topic to talk on. We just uh, finished making a very, very, at the Secular Student Alliance National, we just finished making a very comprehensive resource for leadership transitions. Um, I don't, I, graduation is the absolute uh, least opportune time, the worst situation in which um, the torch can be passed to a new generation because that usually means it was not planned. And that usually means you might buy yourself one semester with a single person who is willing to uh, babysit the group for um, for a few meetings, but with very little real ambition. And that person doesn't want to be president. That's not the president the group um, really wants. And it's usually a recipe for um, the group just dying away after a few more months. Um, the faculty advisors are great for institutional memory. However, different faculty advisors have very different um, philosophies with their involvement, how they see their role. Some of them are the public face of the group. Some of them are the um, are in there. They know all of the members. They know everything the group has done for the last five years. Some of them are there just to sign room reservation forms, and that's it. Um, and there's and then there's everywhere in between. Um, I strongly recommend that if you are an educator and you're not the faculty advisor for your um, campus secular group that is, or, or, or science group, whatever you have on, um, on your campus, that is perfectly okay. Um, still, I get involved, go to their events. Um, if they have um, uh, meetings for um, uh, or, um, regular weekly discussion meetings, that sort of thing, if you can make them, attend them. Um, also encourage the campus groups to build what's called an advisory Board. And the advisory board is, is an, um, um, isn't very common, but it really helps get lots of input from other um, faculty and educators on the campus that want to be involved with the group, and the group wants them to be involved as well. And it's a really, really good way of also getting fresh ideas and uh, I think a completely different um, balance and dynamic going on within the group. And the, the advisory board sounds like it could also be a good way to to somehow make more permanent the connection between an on-campus group and the off-campus groups as well. It wouldn't just have to be people on campus who are part of that board, right? Uh, yes, there are some There are some campus groups that have experimented with off-campus people, um, uh, and there is, um, there is some very mixed opinions on that, and the short version for that is, is that there's actually a legal issue with that mm. because um, although it, as long as the group already exists and they invite off-campus people to their advisory board that's that's okay what what we not only um, discourage at the SSA um, but it's also something we also try to completely release ourselves of the, even the appearance of is off-campus people coming in to a campus group or just a campus and pulling the strings to make something happen and all, all um, anytime there is an off-campus whether it's an organization a cause some some part of really any type of um, of movement and they have some affiliation with a campus group, that question always comes up. And it isn't just with science groups or, or secular groups, um, I, I, um, in a lot of other areas as well where um, a lot of people who really want to protect their, their colleges and universities and even their high schools from um, outside influence um, or uninvited outside influence rather. Um, then that becomes an issue. So if you, but if you are an off-campus person, don't let that deter you from from getting involved. Um, but a lot of uh, on-campus groups will get a little territorial with um, with where they see people trying to go in and tell them what to do. Um, having said that, though, that um, absolutely doesn't mean they don't want your help. Um, on, more often than not, on-campus groups. Um, sooner or later will want the uh, relationship and want the uh, help, assistance, and influence of off-campus groups. And that, that really ties in with what, what you were saying before, Jenny, of you know treating, treating the student groups as partners and as real people with real concerns and the same way that you would anybody else, that you wouldn't just come in and be like, 
well, I know what I'm doing. So here's what, write this down on a piece of paper, but really, you know, building the relationship and, and seeing where it goes from there. Absolutely. Um, and I actually might add one thing to this question about uh, you know, group decay, groups that are um, sort of falling off the map. Um, one thing that I like to think about when I'm seeing a group, you know, slowing down or, uh, you know, less attendance of meetings is what are students actually getting out of this group? Um, are they working towards a shared goal? Um, do they have sort of like a mission statement? What what is the purpose of convening a meeting? What is the purpose of the group? Um, if there's not a clear answer to that question, how can you expect students to be a part of it? Um, so if, if you are noticing that, you know, there's been sort of a cult of personality where people are coming to a group because there's a single leader who's really motivating people, um, it might be useful to have the group come together after that person leaves to think about what are we trying to do together. Um, so that there is some sort of like shared outcomes that they're working towards. And one thing that I know often happens with the, the off-campus Citizens for Science groups can sometimes, you know, there'll be some motivating event. There's a bad bill that's in the legislature or a bad policy in a school board or a state board of education, and a bunch of people come together for that. Uh, and same thing I'm sure happens with campus groups, that they get together, there's some a bunch of, of secular students on campus get pissed off about something and get together to fight that, or a group of students get together for a divestment, and then uh, maybe they win, or maybe the board, hopefully, or you know, the uh, the the board of directors says <laughs> hell no, and and it's and there's like there's they all paths are closed, um, and it's it's certainly been a challenge thinking through for the off campus groups, you know, how do you sustain a group through that? What what what's worked well for you guys doing that on campus? Um, and and can are there things that the off campus groups can do to help that, or are there things that the students groups can do to help the off campus groups uh, sustain themselves through through the lean times of crazy policymakers? Not enough crazy in the world. Need more. <laughs> um, you know, for our side, um, there haven't been that many victories, so we haven't gotten a ton of testing there. Um, for a lot of campuses that have won their divestment campaigns, they've gotten a commitment and are really working towards making sure that's implemented. Um, so we haven't had a ton of experience with that. Um, where we have had victories, students have also begun to fill in a role as uh, movement mentors, sharing how they got to um, that point with other campuses. Mm -hmm. But I don't expect that those groups will last forever. Um, nor should they if, if there's no common goal um, in the future. In terms of campuses that have gotten rejections, that's actually a more interesting case um, because one would expect that if you're asking an administration to do something difficult that you'll get a rejection or you'll get some pushback. Um, and so at that point, it's actually been um, one of the most engaged places that 350 has worked with campus groups, um, really thinking through do you think that it's possible to win this campaign? Um, how could you move this target from um, saying no to saying yes? Um, what can you do as students that actually make saying no more difficult than saying yes? Um, and then perhaps, is there some function of running this campaign other than a victory? Um, do you play some role in the movement as students running a divestment campaign um, to make some sort of cultural change to get the word out, to take action in a place that's safer for you than it might be for other people to take action um, that moves forward the overall movement um, rather than just a victory on your campus. So at that point, we get engaged with, um, you know, whether or not it makes sense for that group to exist. Uh, what we don't want is student groups that, you know, are banging their head against a wall um, for no reason, that they can't identify the reason why. Um, and so that's where we've, we've really been most engaged, is helping students figure out, why are we running this campaign? Is this actually the best use of our time? And if not, let's figure out something else. Well, kind of bouncing off of that, I've seen a lot of students, and I'm sure 
Jenny has as well with where the goal seems a little too far out of reach and they lose sight of what the smaller steps are to get them there and really be able to break down action items. So even if they don't get the super objective, they get um, smaller steps accomplished that really pave the way for future action. And that's one of the things that I, I'm really active with um, student groups on where it is a uh, really a combination of about seven or eight or nine things, including uh, lobbying, letter writing, petitions, uh, collaborative partnerships, social media presence, even media relations and press releases and getting in the local media and, um, and larger um, arena of media involved, plus holding even um, small to medium sized demonstrations and rallies and then um, if, if it is um, a legal matter also um, utilizing um, the resources of whether it's SSA, um, FFRF or even um, a lot, some of the um, also uh, more uh, environmental groups um, and taking legal action. It's uh, um, it's something that uh, more and more groups are getting involved with when it comes to lobbying their local um, or state um, it, uh, legislators for um, taking action. You have your uh, secular coalition chapters, um, even SCA just held its uh, lobby day training last month um, to train uh, uh, people on how to talk to legislators about um, whether it's things like climate change policy or um, really whatever else is um, is um, affecting the the country even on a state level. Um, there are lots and lots of ways that um, that students can be equipped to um, personally engage their administrators or even people beyond that. So um, I know Jenny, you had to run right at noon, so I want to be sure if if people have questions, um, be sure to type them in or raise your hands. Uh, I, I wanted to to come back to a really almost technical question, but before you mentioned, you know, going to their Facebook pages, uh, is, is Facebook the best way to reach out to the student groups or email or how, how are the kids talking about things today, these days? What are, what are they using? Should we Snapchatting them? Oh, you, th that, that's not even funny when we're asking the question, should we be Snapchatting them? Well, the, uh, th there is a really interesting, um, I think, divide once you get into the younger 20s and even uh, past that, uh, or before that rather. Um, the fa Facebook is still, I think, the most common um, means of getting in touch with, uh, with students. Um, email is... Um, Definitely a close second, but more and more students are only um, ever using their campus email, and they are now linking things like social network accounts with their mobile phone number, not an email account. Um, uh, I, having said that, though, that's one of the reasons why um, training people on multi-platform um, uh, advocacy campaigns is uh, so important because there is no is no longer a, um, a fact that. And there's one single network, one single platform or avenue to whether it's engage students, um, make first contact, or even help them affect change. Yeah, I would just ask the group um, what they use. Uh, in the divestment campaign, there's a listserv that student leaders are very active on, um, and I actually haven't had any success um, or haven't really tried because I haven't needed to um, finding people through Facebook. Um, so I think it's all sort of depends on that specific group's culture. Yeah, I've definitely gotten the sense that email, which at one point was sort of the informal way, like rather than bothering to call or whatever, I think has, is regarded more, I, I, the sense I have is that on campuses, it's becoming more regarded as like the really formal thing that if you're being all official, you send an email and you just send a text message or a Facebook message or something if you just want to be like, hey, can I help you with something? Uh, and I think knowing th those those sorts of cultural differences can be really, you know, age-related or, or campus versus off-campus related can be really worth knowing before you start doing that outreach just to say, am I going to come off like totally out of touch with anything if I send an email rather than going to the Facebook page? Because uh, pe people are also shutting down their like trying to close off their social media so that random weird strangers aren't sending them messages through Facebook. So I think, yeah, it's it's going to be cultural. It's going to be different. Different places are going to be different. But uh, being aware 
that those fault lines exist is probably worthwhile? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't give up the phone. Um, you know, it's also something that you should know about yourself, too. If you're not great at email communication, um, or if it's not your most comfortable place, that's probably going to come across in the emails that you send, too. Um, and if you're most comfortable with a phone call, um, usually, you know, try and schedule it or let someone know that you're going to call. Um, but that can be a great way to go about it if, if that's, you know, your comfort place, too. So, um, you know, know yourself as well as knowing the student culture. And so another another question that I've I've often had is when when a, a group like a, a Citizens for Science group is starting up or where there's a local local effort to stop a bad policy in a school board or something else and a group is coming together they say we should have a website um, and people who are doing this often don't have the skills necessary to create and maintain that and I'll say hey you know if you're on campus maybe there's a campus one of the political clubs or the biology club or an SSA group or something else that has similar goals, you know, maybe you could reach out to those groups and see if they, if there's someone there who has those skills. Um, is that, am I giving good advice by saying that? And is there a way I can, there, I'm sure that there are ways to do that that would sort of come off as offensive as like, you're students, you understand these computers, you do, you deal with that stuff. Uh, but are there are there good ways? Is there is there a right way to make that sort of approach? Um, and this is around support for um, your own web web structures. Yeah, and I mean, you know, sort of. So it's partly how do you recruit students into those groups, but it's also if there's a really specific task, and you're pretty sure that the right place to go to find someone with the skills that you need is a student group. Um, what's, what's the way to make that approach in a way that's, that, that does do all the things that you were talking about of engaging people, but you don't necessarily know which student it is, but you really need somebody. You really need help. I would just ask. Um, yeah. and, and if they're interested, they'll say yes. And if they aren't, they'll say no. Um, but I'll just you know keep my broken record going and say, Build those relationships now because you're much more likely to get support from a student group that knows you, that you've worked together before. Um, so it's not just you know some random person calling you and saying, "Help me with Facebook." And there, I feel like it is. It's not just envelope stumping. That's something that, among among its benefits, is that it you know help me set up this WordPress site, and that is something that you can put on the resume, and that is actually employers will appreciate. Oh, you helped design a website. Cool even if you weren't paid for it or, you know, I mean, if people have, have budgets, you know, a lot of these, these students for science groups, their budget is the $10 that someone put in the jar. But if you do, you know, students, students like to get paid also they're they don't have a lot of, of resources. Uh, and, you know, if you're in a position to offer internships, paid internships are, are way better than the alternative uh, for all sorts of reasons, not least the sorts of people that you can recruit to do the work. Uh, someone who can take the summer off and not have to pay off work study, not have to, doesn't have commitments through student loans or other things. Uh, it, it gives you a, a broader applicant pool uh, and you can reach audiences who may really want to have a career in science or really want to have a career in organizing, um, but can't afford not to get paid over the summer or not afford, or, or elsewhere in the year. Um, so if there's, if there's any possibility, it's way better to do that. I know. I don't know. If, I assume that you guys are going to agree with that. Absolutely. Yeah. I agree, and I also think that when reaching out to student groups, if you can, um, if you're, not, if the person is off campus group is not able to get on campus group um, uh, long term help uh, with putting together, let's say, a website or something like that, ask them a permission to basically just steal everything that is on their current website or a website that that you really like. Uh, talk to the owner, tell them where you're coming from and why, um, uh, if um, why you're basically um, asking this and just let them know that uh, you're going to basically just plagiarize, rip, steal as though you have absolutely no creativity or innovation whatsoever. And the reason I say that is because that is what I did when I abruptly became leader of my student group and we needed to get online in about five minutes. And uh, and it was a 
uh, complete success and um, we were able to get off the ground with uh, minimal um, uh, technical knowledge on the particular front um, and the uh, and so we reached out to another group and just basically said can we have everything you have and they said you can have that and more and it was a wonderful experience and I, I know many other groups who have done very very similar things so Jenny, I know, know you need to run soon, so I, we should probably sign off. Um, but do, do you guys have any final thoughts? Last last words of wisdom uh, or summaries of, of what's, what's come so far that you want to add? Yeah, um, I think I've said a lot of what I wanted to say around um, students not being a resource, but being you know potential new members and allies and friends. Um, I guess I would just say um, when you're reaching out to students, just trust them. Their whole job is to study and improve themselves and build these kinds of relationships. That's what they do all day, every day. Um, and the more you can really uh, trust students and vocally trust them, um, the more they're going to really step into whatever they're being asked to do. Um, I know for myself as a student, having a community member who um, trusted me and and really told me like no one can do this but you and you need to do it um, is the reason why I'm still an organizer today so um, yeah really give them um, responsibility uh, power and leadership um, and I don't think you'll be disappointed students are great Dan any any last thoughts uh, yeah, this is really just the beginning, I think, um, for, for many people who might be watching this about how to engage student groups or get, get more involved with them on um, on different future activities and events. Uh, if you're not sure what angle you would take to get involved with them, feel free to email, um, whether it's the Secular Student Alliance at organizer at secularstudents.org or email me personally at dan.pemberton at secular students.org, I would be more than happy to um, get you connected with a uh, local group that um, I think would be a good fit for what you're looking to do or kind of um, where you want your level of involvement to be at. Um, or I can definitely get you connected with someone who might be um, uh, ge more geographically closer to where you are and they could get a feel for um, what's in the area. Um, but either way, uh, reach out to us. That's, that is precisely what we are here for. We have very large um, uh, staff team um, at the SSA who, who do just this. Well, thank you both so much. I, I, I learned a lot. I hope folks watching this learned a lot and enjoyed it. Um, I know I did, and it was a great discussion. And I look forward to more of them in the future with both of you. So thank you all. Thank you all uh, out there for attending. And I hope that you will spread the word about these series. Next month, we're going to talk about petitions. Yay, petitions. Um, how to use online petitions effectively for good campaigns, which is trickier than it sounds. So please sign up for that. Uh, and But not that tricky. So, um, so please do sign up for that and, and take part and spread the word that we're doing this because I think it's pretty cool. And, uh, and, and do, do give me feedback about topics that you would like to see covered in future months. Um, you know, I, I want this to be responsive. Part of the reason that we did this topic was uh, people were asking, we've gotten questions from the, the local groups of, you know, how do, we, how do we bring in more people to be part of, of the efforts that Citizens for Science groups are doing? And reaching out to students uh, and, and bringing, bringing fresh young blood into the, to the effort like that is certainly going to be a key way. And I think uh, Dan and Jenny had really great advice about, in general, the advice that would work very well for reaching out to people who are not students as well as students. So thank you both for that. And with that, I will gavel this to a close. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Josh. Thank you.